This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. And we're back with a brand new exciting episode of Mark cautiously reviewing anime while praying to every single god that he has a job when he wakes up tomorrow. I wish I was joking. And not even that, right? There's a fight in this video that I'm gonna cover which I know my take will have people looking to castrate me, but hey, Joke's on you, Toei already beat you to it. There are some incredible fights in Shonen, some iconic moments that have stayed the test of time. Moments like the final battle in Cowboy Bebop, the final revelation of what exactly was in Eren Yeager's basement. And look, even Toei has produced some of the most awe-inspiring moments in all of the culture with Luffy saving Ace and Goku transforming finally into the legendary Super My point is, Naruto is one of the most iconic animes to ever anime, and these stories that I'll be covering today show us exactly why it's held up so fondly by those that have read it. So, without further preamble, I'm Totally Not Mark, and this is my blind review of Pain's Assault in the painful, wonderful, and incredible Masashi Kishimoto's Naruto. Let's get it. the Batman will be Batmaning his way onto our collective theater screens next month, and in light of this fact, I've decided to do what I've never done before. Actually attempt to learn anything about Batman. I've seen a couple of the newer films and none of the ones before 2008, which I think gives me a rare perspective. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been reading a bunch of Batman comics to build up my knowledge of the character, and over the final two weeks of this month, I'll be making two videos wherein I review every single Batman film ever made. And yes, that includes everything from the latest in the DC Cinematic Universe to whatever this is. And so I hope you all will join me on this journey starting next week. See you there. Last time I covered the Itachi storyline, which came to a shocking and brilliant climax. That story had focused a tremendous amount on the dynamic between Sasuke and his brother, and with good reason. It needed the space to tell that story, and to be honest, the beginning of this next arc suffers from that decision slightly. Only slightly, however, and I'll get into that in a second. Firstly, however, I'd like to unpack Jiraiya's death and why I loved the way it was handled, and also to share some thoughts I had concerning a particular decision I found... Uh, strange. First, the good. The scene showcasing Tsunade and Naruto discovering Jiraiya's fate and their grieving respectively with the news were appropriately tragic yet beautiful. When Kishimoto dedicates time to quietly exploring a character's more vulnerable sides, I genuinely think he really shines as a mangaka. Furthermore, I really like the idea of leaving behind a riddle or cipher for Naruto that requires solving which, in this particular arc, acted as a very natural means for Shikamaru to reach out to Naruto personally for help in solving this cipher, revealing a conversation that speaks to the responsibilities of growing up that they both need to face. Shonen as a genre is always dealing with and concerning itself with children coming of age, but there isn't normally a dedication to what one should do once those years are over and where they need to find fulfillment in that part of their lives. Having turned 30 recently, I found myself resonating with that message a lot. That drive to mentor the next generation, to be the ones who buy the ramen rather than being the snot-nosed little kids, as he calls it. In other words, it's time to grow up and to stop sulking. We need more stories to glorify these more mature parts of our lives, as I think there's somewhat of a stigma for people that once you get over a certain age, that it's all downhill from there. When in actuality, it's all about perspective. But hey, what do I know? I'm just an old man. Anyways, those were all my favorite parts of the ending that really spoke to me. There was, however, one aspect to it that, while a technical issue, still didn't really feel convincing to me. As I mentioned, I really like the idea of having to figure out how to decipher this cipher. It's a nice mystery to keep us entertained while we deal with the emotional outpouring on behalf of Jiraiya. However, when it came to deciphering that code, my first thought when I saw it was, oh, those numbers must refer to page numbers. In his makeout series of books, right? But then my second thought was, no, that's dumb. There's no way an author would have a comprehensive knowledge of the exact words that begin each and every page in his novel off the top of his head in the heat of battle. If he got one thing wrong, then it wouldn't have worked at all. And okay, look, I know this might sound unreasonable, but look, let's take, for example, this script I'm running right now, or better yet, the Attack on Titan script I wrote earlier last year. That monster was over 60 pages, and bear in mind, still not as long as his novels. And I worked on it for months. Despite, however, it being shorter and therefore easier to remember than those pages from his book series, I couldn't tell you what the first word on the first page of that script is. Heck, 
I couldn't even tell you what the first word of this script is and I wrote that yesterday. With that said, however, it is a cute idea and I like how Naruto provides the insight necessary for them to solve the code wherein Jiraiya explains that the one in control is not among the group in pain. All right, time for Naruto's sage training. As I've said numerous times before, I'm a massive fan of training arcs. I think they add a lovely bit of variety in a story to break up the constant talking and fighting while continuously feeding into the themes of the greater narrative. This part is no different. And what I did notice during this one was, once again, despite Naruto and Sasuke's paths having diverged in a very significant way earlier in time, their core story beats are still in sync together somewhat. Take, for example, the last two arcs. Both Sasuke and Naruto have lost people profoundly important to them on a fundamental level in diametrically opposed ways that both have led the young pupils to receive significant enhancements to their prior abilities, thanks to their loved ones passing, both of which they would in a heartbeat return to life in exchange for those newly acquired powers. We've explored Sasuke's predicament already in the last video, so this arc in turn shifts the focus to Naruto once again as we follow his tutelage under the Toad Hermit. In terms of mechanical differences, once again I'm a massive fan of what this new ability means for Naruto moving forward, and I love how Naruto's pre-existing abilities allow him to advance quickly in this complex crash course in Senjutsu. This idea of being able to derive power from nature and the world around him is so cool and the means with which Naruto later learns to apply this technique in ways never before seen by even his master speaks to both the past of this series and indeed Naruto as a character himself. Someone that's capable of inventing an option C when someone gives him two options he doesn't agree with. This is a sign of a naive mindset working in a positive fashion I think. Which again works in great contrast to what Sasuke ends up doing towards the beginning of this arc, I believe. Following his acquisition of the Eight Tailed Spirit and the use of the newfound power courtesy of his brother, Sasuke explains to his fellow Uchiha and Akatsuki member why he can be trusted in doing what's in line with the Akatsuki mission and to go against his brother's wishes of protecting Kanoa. And to be honest, it reads as pretty juvenile and overly simplistic considering everything he's been through, almost to an unbelievable extent. I understand his motivations and his reasoning on a technical level but at this point he should realize that things are often more complicated than they might appear to be. That was the entire point of his misunderstanding with his brother. And while he might believe that he more than likely does have a greater handle on the reality of the current circumstances, the fact that he's moving forward with this line of thinking without any hesitation just proves that he still has so much more to learn, which will be entertaining once Naruto and he inevitably clash down the line. And look, okay, I know you're waiting for me to talk about the big, big fight that's coming up, but one small thing first. Now I know cousin it from the Adams family is real, hashtag Yas Queen squad goals, but it's time to get trimmed up with Manscaped's new Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer. You get this wonderful waterproof shaver and more when you purchase their new performance package 4.0. Along with it comes the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toning Spray to keep you smelling fresh all damn day. But did you know that for a limited time only, when you pick up the performance package 4.0, you also get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxers. These cooling boxer briefs might actually be one of the coolest parts of this collection. What's the point in manscaping your bits like a pro if you're just gonna throw on some rags afterwards? Not only are Manscaped's boxers extra comfy, but they have fancy crop cooling technology to keep you cool and dry all day long. The fabric's super soft and comes in a wide range of sizes all the way up to triple XL. And what's neat is that you get to opt into their peak hygiene plan, which means you'll get a new pair every cycle straight to your door. If all that sounds good, then head over to manscaped.com and use promo code NOTMARK20 for 20% off, free international shipping, and two free gifts. Underwear! To your door! Your paws will thank you. Bye. Speaking more broadly for a second about this arc's pacing, there's a lot of bouncing around to different points of view early in this arc. We get Naruto's sage training, which I like, Sasuke's acquisition of the Eight-Tailed Spirit, his conversation with the Akatsuki members following that, that dude's community trying to track down the Eight-Tailed Spirit in him, those same folks making a plan to stage a summit, Tsunade trying to figure out Jiraiya's message, and we also have Pain's attack on Kanoa. And while I can appreciate that these are all necessary points of view and do serve the story in fact, I just didn't find most of them very interesting at all once here. I think when it comes to what this arc contains and what the last arc contains, that being two massive battles, it's natural to have all the exposition and busy work taken care of between the more hype moments to allow space for them to 
brief. And the bigger the battles, the more exposition that needs to be squeezed in in between. And unfortunately, this is that case. Which is reasonable. It just so happens that this section, unfortunately, is sandwiched between the two biggest battles in the story so far, and I think the pacing suffered quite a lot during these early chapters as a result. Was it boring? Eh, kind of. Was it worth what we got after this? Oh my god, yes. Pain vs. Kanoa Pain's invasion of Kanoa Gakure is the opening act of what ends up being one of the biggest and best fights in the series so far. And maybe because I'm a big fan of Naruto as a character, but I sincerely enjoyed this more than Sasuke vs. Itachi, and I loved that fight. But perhaps it's not a fair comparison because this one had so many different people fighting to hold the line, waiting for Naruto to finish his training and to save the day. There are tons of moving parts in this one. Kicking things off with different battles held across the greater village area, the use of strategy and the implementation and acquisition of new information turns all of these fights on their respective heads, with each individual understanding that each encounter could be their last against these monsters, and that if they are going to lose their lives here, they may as well do so while gaining precious intel to help enhance the village's chances of survival. And this, unfortunately, applies to everyone, from Konohamaru all the way to the great Kakashi. The quick exchange between Pain and Kakashi once again, despite Naruto and Sasuke having steamrolled ahead in terms of ability, highlights the fact that Kakashi is still managing to remain a remarkably resourceful and focused warrior for Konoha, utilizing brilliant strategy through very convincing clones to drag out more intel from the situation regarding Pain for the use of others in this battle. Furthermore, these more desperate measures serve to act as a tremendously effective means of building tension. I mean, even Kakashi is pulling out all the stops and he's struggling. But, as I mentioned, there are a host of different battles taking place all over the village with a real sense of dread and hopelessness hanging in the air. Particularly when Choza is thought to be dead and Kakashi sacrifices his own safety in order to allow Choji to relay that message, that intel, they gathered back to Tsunade. And, once he got there, Tsunade could sense Choza's energy, but no one else's. It's at this point Kishimoto once again leans on his wonderful sensibilities with regards to these more emotional or sentimental moments. Seldom as they are, when they do show up, they really hit their mark. Having grown up being treated as though he was an outsider, despite Pain demanding to know the location of Naruto, despite him threatening everyone's lives, the people of Kanoa won't sell out Naruto. As we're reminded of all he's achieved through the eyes of Kanoa's citizens, it's a brilliant lens for which to view this part of the battle through, seeing what Naruto means to them and how far this story has progressed as a result. Speaking of progression, Alright, I gotta say, that was really sick. And getting to see this kid now having grown up some once again speaks to the fostering of this new generation Shikamaru touched on earlier as well. Naruto gave this kid some of his time and guidance and now he's capable of performing feats such as this. The Rasengan is a fucking crazy powerful move to pull out as a surprise attack. All right, but okay. <laughs> Switching gears for a second and checking in with Naruto, he's after encountering a small teeny tiny problem. Due to the fox spirit, unlike Jiraiya, the toads can't rest on his shoulders to facilitate this technique's charge time. Which means, now Naruto is faced with a specific problem unique to him. Without someone on his shoulder to focus that energy on his behalf, he now needs to figure out a way of staying still in combat in order to focus on gathering that energy without getting killed by pain. Easier said than done, right? And, okay, somewhat troublingly, pain eventually finds out where Naruto is, after which... The unthinkable happens. Naruto versus Pain. Chaos reigning from above, the entire village destroyed, and even Tsunade in way over her head trying to protect as many people as she can from the onslaught. As the dust clouds fade, there Naruto stands ready to lay down his life for all of those that afforded him the time to prepare with theirs. There's a wonderfully tragic but exciting moment that shows itself as the ignition for this fight specifically. Now that Naruto has mastered this natural chakra business, he can sense everyone's energy, but not Kakashi's. He calmly asks if he's on a mission elsewhere, and it's all to no response. He knows his fate. 
A younger, weaker, and more naive Naruto would have, in this instance, exploded in anger, throwing caution to the wind as well as his strategy, practically assuring his defeat and securing everyone else's downfall. But it's different now. He's grown up. As we saw through the eyes of the villagers earlier, Naruto is no longer a child, and it's time for him to prove that in the grandest of ways, and in doing so, setting an example for the next generation, choosing to carefully channel his anger into attacking the Pain Gang. And boy, does he do just that. The opening gambit of this conflict is honestly brilliant and full of just the right amount of determination, motivation, and strategy. Everything I love in a good Naruto fight. We know what Naruto is fighting for, we know how far he's come, we are currently learning all the strengths and weaknesses of the pain group, and Naruto's strategy once again is something only he can manage to pull off thanks to his seemingly bottomless supply of chakra, leaving shadow clones behind him to charge away elsewhere as batteries for the sage energy. It's a remarkably good strategy turning a weakness into a strength, a very Naruto thing to do. And the best part of this entire opening to this fight is that the guy who has been stealing all the Jinchuriki power from all the folks in the pain group manages to get a hold of Naruto himself. This would normally be a catastrophic failure on Naruto's part, and while it was a mistake, like always, Naruto finds a way of turning something negative into a positive. Because Naruto needed to be still in order to gather that sage jutsu, that wasn't a viable strategy for approaching this battle. He would have been open to attack. However, in that hold with this guy, he can do just that. Stay still, which then led to that pain guy absorbing too much sage jutsu, thus turning him into a frog creature because he can't control it. That was such a fucking creative and cool moment with a decent depth of cause and effect and while it's still fresh in my mind at this moment in time it is my favorite switcheroo in the story finally it comes to light exactly what is happening with regards to the pain puppet and who the puppeteer is i thought it was really cool to finally get a chance to see nagato since we haven't really seen him since the flashbacks with jiraiya though he looks like shit now i like the thematic significance of his mission through pain nagato explains to naruto his vision for the world and in the process really puts a bunch of conflict into naruto's mind through pain both literally and metaphorically nagato is showing the world what his vision for the future is and what justice he wants to bring. And without Naruto willing to make a move, Hinata jumps in, confesses her respect and love for Naruto. Stop! He's already dead! And gets taken out. God, he's got bones on him. This looks kind of awkward, but surprisingly cool. I didn't think it would look cool, but it actually does. In execution with the body of the fox building itself around Naruto as the tails sprout, it's a really cool visual indication of progression towards a known endpoint, which I would imagine is the fully realized fox spirit in its physical form. But okay, we finally got into the moment that you've all been waiting for. The meme fight. Okay, I'm going to switch on my camera for this bit. I'll be talking a lot about animation and I'm not trusting Japan's copyright laws at this moment in time. Let it be known that in preparation for this section of the video, I have read the manga and viewed the corresponding episodes of the anime that this controversial piece of animation has stemmed from. I recognize that I will be attempting to give my personal opinion on a subjective but widely discussed topic on the internet, but I guess I'm a maverick like that. With that said, I will try to ground my reasoning in terms as uncontroversial as I can, and I will do so by trying to answer the question, is this a good depiction of this fight? There are, of course, those of you out there that think obviously no and obviously yes to that answer, so let's take a closer look. For me, what makes a fight scene great is multifaceted. Story, animation, artwork, and yes, those are two separate things, pacing, immersiveness, and overall storyboarding or direction of a scene. And interestingly, the animation plays a role in all of these aspects. When it comes to animation quality, I think it's a massively impressive showcase of an animator's skills in that department. The animator in question here that worked on this scene was Shinga Yamashita, and odds are you've seen his work before in the past and not just from this scene. 
In fact, he's since gone on to direct and composite for other anime. I mean, he has been incredibly successful with the openings of Jujutsu Kaisen, but that's Jujutsu Kaisen. That's not Naruto, and this has become a beast into and of itself. I had seen this clip of animation and I knew people didn't like it. However, it is important to keep in mind when I say animation that I am not referring to the piece's likeness to the characters. Animation is the illusion of movement and to varying degrees different series have iconic examples of this and examples of tragically poor animation also. Sometimes in the biggest of properties in Japan. One of my favorite animators that worked on Dragon Super back in the day was a man by the name of Naoki Tate. Hello there. He too was a controversial artist because some people loved him and others hated him. And once again, it boiled down entirely to what one as an audience member was looking for. If they were looking for crazy dynamic animation, then Tate was their guy. If they were looking for model sheet accuracy, and he wasn't. And this fight here with Pain seems to tell the very same story but in an even more exaggerated fashion. The gestures, the smears, the squash and stretch is all there in aggressive effect and as a result the scene is filled with a ton of energy. It's exciting, it's dynamic, it's energetic, it feels alive and moreover, for the most part, not too dissimilar to other big action episodes within this series of Naruto. However, with that said, let's take a look at the other side of this coin. Character likeness and its importance. I am a big fan of Sakuga or high quality animation from Japan. I'm interested in the subject and I like studying it a little more closely than the average bear. And taking that into consideration, if someone values character art consistency more than animation and movement, then that's not only perfectly reasonable, it's probably how most people feel too. And with good reason. The purpose of animation is to enhance the story that's being told through it, and one important way of achieving that desired effect is by suspending the audience's disbelief, for them to get invested in the characters and forget that they're watching animation. However, I believe one could very easily make the argument that if any animation takes someone out of the story, and the story is what you're there for, then to those people that animation would have failed in living up to its purpose. In other words, if in this fight with pain you found it distracting to the point of it taking you out of the story or fight that was taking place, then that animation, despite it being intentionally exaggerated and technically impressive, fails to serve the primary purpose of animation for that person, which is to tell the story in a dramatic fashion in keeping with the tone of the manga. But okay, I've explained why I think some people like it and why some people hate it. But what do I think? Well, it's complicated. When it came to this approach, I think there's a tremendous amount of talent on display when it comes to conveying movement and a sense of energy. The timing is really nice and all that jazz, and I'm also a fan of simple shapes in order to facilitate movement. So, from a philosophical standpoint, I appreciate the approach taken. However, the moments, or moment, that people seem to take issue with, even I have to admit feels like they are pushing the envelope far too far when it comes to some of the exaggerations. Again, this isn't evident of poor animation quality, certainly not, as I believe the animation to be quite brilliant here. It is, however, I think a result either of not enough time reserved for corrections or perhaps not the right direction for that scene. At least I think so. While as I mentioned that I appreciate the philosophy behind the approach taken, I think it veered too far into Looney Tune territory when it came to some of the choices made which ultimately took me completely out of the moment that these scenes were trying to deliver for. So, in short, I think the artist that worked on this was incredibly talented, and I think that the vast majority was perfectly within the realms of what the show had produced before. But, I do however think that the vision Shinjo Yamashita had for part of this final product was, perhaps, too far outside of what many of us, including me, consider to be within the boundaries of reasonable artistic license. When I saw this, I wasn't thinking about how awesome the fight was, I wasn't thinking about the story. I was instead thinking about the animation and how I felt that it didn't match the show's overall approach, which distracted me from my primary reason for watching anime, the story. But that's just my take. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Personally, I think there's a happy medium to be found here that would please more people than this ultimately did without alienating the Sakuga fans. Take Nokitate's best moments from Dragon Super. These are perfect examples of this sort of loose minimalistic animation being corrected to accommodate for both stylistic consistency as well as a tremendous energy in animation. And so, I think if Yamashita had some of his cuts corrected for model correctness, it wouldn't have created as big of a shitstorm as it did otherwise online. But that's just my two cents.
Also, I think I'll probably keep up the face cam for the rest of this video, because Lord knows I am recording this review way too late and my editor is tired. I'll probably be doing more face cam in the future too to help distance myself from the material that has, in the past, nuked my channel. Speaking broadly about the fight for a second, I thought the action was bombastic and the contrast between how the fox fights versus how Naruto fights is appropriately stark. It helps to reinforce the dedication to strategy and technique Naruto the person is and how inconsiderate the fox is to the village and world around him, interested only in destroying what stands in opposition to him, which as it happens helps to elevate one of the most surprising scenes I've yet come across. For the last two volumes, this story has built up to one gigantic climax within this fight, and interestingly, Kishimoto subverts this expectation through this scene. Naruto's first meeting with his father, the fourth Hokage. And as I'm sure many of you are aware at this point, I've never been a massive fan of fight scenes unless they have compelling ties to the narrative by way of mystery or whatever. But I am and always have been a massive fan of quiet, introspective moments full of character-rich dialogue, and that's exactly what this is. During this encounter, the fourth Hokage is collected, compassionate, and wise while Naruto is reasonably upset and elated at what he's learned. He physically lashes out at his father before basking momentarily in the fact that he's the fourth Hokage's son, which is again such a Naruto thing to do, particularly during a time where he's made to feel confused and uncertain thanks to pain. He feels like a child. There's a neat conversation about the philosophy surrounding what Naruto is struggling with what pain has taught him his motivations were, and in response to that, the fourth Hokage explains that where there's love, there will be hate, and the duty of the shinobi is to fight the hatred before it turns into pain and suffering. The fourth tells Naruto that he doesn't know the answer to his problems, but believes that Naruto will find the answer himself, before sealing away the fox spirit and leaving Naruto to return to the battle. The words of encouragement echoing in his ears from Kakashi, Jiraiya, and now his father. He stands once more to the challenge that pain presents him, that Nagato presents him. Once again, there are some great visuals where the benefits of the Sage technique, even when not in use, become apparent. Thanks to that chakra being used in place of his own natural supply, Naruto's clones explode onto the page in a beautiful spread, which again reminds me of the story's beginning when he first used that technique, setting himself up for the Rasengan. What a brilliant move. The climax to this conflict is, instead of action, a conversation. A philosophical conversation wherein Naruto expresses a desire, Nagato explains his pain, and Naruto shows his maturity. Again, something I need to make clear is that my videos aren't a substitute for the original material, so I won't be explaining exactly what's said, but instead giving my impressions on it. But I think right from the beginning, when Naruto expresses that he did not see his defeat of pain as a victory, I thought again that this is another wonderful step towards the theme of maturity for Naruto. But the story also never shied away from the ugliness of hatred. He can't just ignore that Nagato killed Jiraiya and Kakashi, but his memory of his master's parting lesson can stop him from continuing this cycle of violence, reinforcing that it is a choice that you can choose not to hurt people to not cause more pain. <laughs> Nagato's backstory was interesting, but a line that stood out to me was this. I will rule this world and make the suffering stop. This is a very naive and overly simplistic view of how the world should be under him. Naruto's journey in this arc has been about him accepting his role in becoming an adult, needing to learn patience and to think things through and to prepare the world for the next generation. And in a way, that's exactly what Nagato wants to do too, however, with a lot more purposeful suffering. Jiraiya is quoted as saying, a person matures, grows up, when you experience pain. And as I'm sure you've noticed, this is a perfect continuation to the themes of growing up and maturity at play here too for Naruto. The situations regarding Nagato and his issue surrounding the illusion of peace for these larger nations following times of bloodshed is a really interesting perspective and a tragically honest experience he and many others have shared. And Naruto doesn't necessarily have any solution for it, other than that he won't give up and he will find a solution to this problem. Admitting that he still hates him, but understands why he is the way that he is, and most importantly decides not to hurt him. Naruto asks for Nagato to believe that he won't harden with pain, to believe that he won't grow resentful or vengeful, that he will earnestly seek out peace in the name of his master and for the good of the world. 
Where Nagato's pain pushed him to embrace a negative path, Naruto's helped him to embrace a positive one. With this conversation speaking to Jiraiya's lesson to Nagato, Naruto has every reason to hate and despise Nagato for everything that he's done. However, after hearing his story, Naruto can use his own life experiences, his own pain to empathize and sympathize with Nagato, much the same way he did with Gara during the Chunin exams. Thus avoiding conflict, Naruto's pain was a source of peace in this instant. This manages to reach Nagato, and while this ending might feel much like Nagato's thoughts on the matter, a little overly simplistic, as a set of lessons to live by, I think there's some great stuff here that's all rooted in Naruto as he exists as a character. I'm not sure I'm a massive fan of the resurrecting of Shinobi and people who died during the battle, as it does remove a lot of the consequences and followed from this arc, but is it worth it for when Naruto arrives back at Kanoa to a hero's welcome? I think absolutely. The lonely boy that once sought after recognition and acknowledgement is now the hero of his village, a beloved member of the society who is now armed with a new perspective for which to better understand Sasuke, who he seems to be destined to collide with very soon. How will this pan out? I don't know, but if the off notes are anything to go by, or these volumes that are slowly dwindling behind me are any indication, it's that we are quickly heading for the home stretch. Will it be good? Will I like it? I don't know, probably. But if you do want to continue with me on this journey, please consider subscribing. It costs nothing and means the world to myself and my team. But that'll do it for this week. I've been Toy Not Mark. I'll see you all next week and thank you so much for watching.